I had this, this overwhelming sense of, whoa, what do I do now? And Jesus told me, we're going for a walk. So we went down the mountain and we landed in a, in a playground. I thought, this is, this is weird. And uh, as, as we're talking and, and Jesus goes off and he goes and hides in a bush. I'm like, oh, okay. And while he's doing this, there's all these faceless children just running around aimlessly doing their thing because it's a playground. And uh, I start, you know, going after Jesus and I realize that I'm no longer me. I'm one of these faceless children and I'm chasing after Jesus. And, you know, I get close to the bush and then he moves to another bush and he peeks around and I go and I chase him a little bit and... Um, eventually Jesus stops and, and I realize that it's not just me chasing him, it's, it's all these little faceless children and we're all chasing him. So eventually he stops and, uh, and we all go like rugby, huddle him and, and it's really an awesome moment and all of a sudden I'm not in me anymore and I'm third person and I'm watching this and Jesus turns to me and he says, this is how I want you to come. This is how I want you to come. And so after sharing that with the worship team this morning, we've decided that we need to answer this in a physical way. And so this morning we're going to be worshiping a little differently because we're here and how else do we become like children short of running around in our underwear? So we, we thought this would be slightly more appropriate. <laughs> so would you please join with us in worship this morning? Lord, and again, just this morning, we want to just repent before you and say that which you have intended for us to relish in and be joyful in your presence. Sometimes we make it such a grown-up thing. <laughs> where we stand and it's more like the party where everyone is checking out who's wearing what and who's drinking what and who's, who arrived in what car and oh, it's not your heart, Lord. It's the playground and you're the coolest guy on the playground and you're running around and the kids are coming after you because they know that you're the source of fun. You're the source of life. You're the source of joy. You're the source of peace. You're the source of everything that is good and everything that feels good and feels right is found in you, Lord. And thank you that we can come to you this morning and that you just take us as we are and you're not judging us. You just want to be with us. Lord, with this breath in our lungs, we want to praise you and we want to lift you up. You're such a great God. You're such a good God. We worship you, Lord. We thank you that we could come before you like children this morning. Because your word even says, Lord, unless you come like a child, you cannot even inherit the kingdom of God. So this morning, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for how you have revealed yourself to us, Lord, during our worship, Lord. And thank you that we could just come so freely, God, without shame, just before you, God. And you accept us like a father does. We thank you for who you are, Lord. Thank you for your presence that is in this place. And I ask, Lord, that as we go into the rest of the service, that, that your presence would just continue just to move, Lord. That you'd continue to speak to us, Lord. Continue to, to do something in our hearts, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you'll... That you'll break shame, Lord. That you'll break these things that, that are keeping us from being like a child, Lord. That we can truly be free in your presence. Thank you that you, that you are here. That we can experience you, Lord. We worship you so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank uh, you so much. Well, last, last, last two Sundays... Uh, 
we've been going through just celebrating Jesus and just taking uh, Jesus and just going in reverse. So from his second coming and his ascension, which we looked at in, um, in the first Sunday um, of December, just looking at uh, how uh, we need to be the, uh, yeah, how did, uh, yeah, how we need to be living and um, um, and doing the, uh, uh, all those things, and then um, and then last week we looked at um, at being alive and what the resurrection means in our life, and uh, and using our breath really just to just to just to glorify God and live for Him. Uh, today I want to go to part three, and we're going to be looking at the crucifixion and um, and what that means to us, and uh, and. Yeah, and you can all gather where we're going with it. We are going towards his birth because we are celebrating Christmas. So if anyone was wondering where we're going with this, that's where we're going if you haven't worked it out yet. So um, uh, part three, I just want to just read a scripture verse there, Matthew uh, 27 verse 50. And it says, there, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And... But what I want us just to take a moment this morning is just to think and remember what Jesus has done for us and, um, and why he did that and what it does in our lives and what it means for us as believers. So I just want to close in prayer and then, uh, no, not close in prayer, open up in prayer this message. <laughs> Sorry, yes. It's been a long week. <laughs> uh, yeah, I might as well have been on the RFKC camp that happened, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm going to open up in prayer, and then we're going to just watch a video before I just uh, share God's word with us. Lord, I ask that you just minister to us, that you just speak to us as I just share this message, Lord, about your crucifixion and what it does in our lives and what it means in our lives. And I ask, Lord, that that gratefulness would rise up in our hearts and that we'll also just see what it is and that we'll live the way that you have called us to live, Lord. I ask even as this video plays, Lord, that you speak to us through this video. In Jesus' name. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And... Why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus going to the cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is, this has gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free, open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper? What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We want Barabbas. Yeah. Give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah. People love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, for you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. And God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent, for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. When I look at the story, I realize who Barabbas really is. That's me. That's you. That's us. And I felt 
God, I was reading this the other day, and I felt God speak to me. I love Barabbas. I love him. But God, he's a bad man. I love him. And I wanted him to go free. But didn't you know that he probably would have never acknowledged the freak? Yep, yeah, but I love Barabbas. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son for Barabbas. Even the one he knew would walk away from Jesus and his free gift and never come back. He loves him. And the nerve, the call, the audacity of believers to think, I got saved by grace, but now that I'm in this deep, dark place of bondage, I'm going to work hard to get myself out. What? That's the opposite of the gospel. Are you bound? Are you held under the power of this temptation, this sin? Do you feel like it's controlling you? What are you going to do? I'm going to shake myself free. Stop it! No, you won't! You're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin. You will not overcome it and you will never overcome it. You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own marriage, your own your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And he's the one that took your place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take my chains off and I say, no, no, I deserve I deserve it. Jesus seems to look at me and say, no, son. Let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No. So shame, give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games, we can play church games, we can pretend like some people are better than others and that's why they're blessed, or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God, and it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believe in the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive. Let me have your sin, son. Okay. When I give him my sin, I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking supposed to be whipped as I stand a free man all the attention is turned now and I feel the love of God saying go son live your life I'll pay the price where did we get off thinking that we were gonna set ourselves free it's still Jesus it'll always be Jesus it'll never stop being the power of Jesus if his blood sufficient for your salvation. His blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough!
the price was paid in full. And yet, somehow, us as believers, we still want to hold on to these things. But this morning, I want to, I want to look at, um, at specifically shame in people's lives, especially believers. You know, we, we, we live this life and we've got, we've got so much shame because of what we've done. And, and when we hold on to these things, when we hold on to the bondage, when we hold on to the chains, basically what we're saying to God is, Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough. And that's not the truth. His sacrifice was enough. It was enough so that you and I can walk free so that our sins are completely paid for. You see, what shame does is it, is it causes us to hide. If you look at Adam and Eve in the garden, they sinned, and all of a sudden they, they realized they were naked. So what did they do? They hid themselves. They hid themselves. And shame does the same thing to us. Some of us hide behind being an introvert. Some of us hide behind being an extrovert. Some of us hide behind joking. Some of us hide behind seriousness. Some of us hide behind watching TV series. Some of us hide behind our jobs. Some of us hide behind all these different things. But it's all just because we're holding on to shame. Whereas the sacrifice was enough. So the question is, what do we do with this? We have to run to the right place. You have to hide in the right place. It doesn't help hiding in your own self or in your own life, in your own circumstance, and just, and just being like, well, I did it, I deserve it, and that's it, so let me just be out. No, it doesn't help. I want to read from Hebrews 6, verse 18 to 19. It says, As God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. There's another translation that we, have, that we who have fled to the refuge. And carry on there. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. What we need to be doing as believers when we sin, when we come short, not just hiding ourselves and just pretending that it's all right. What we need to be doing, we need to be running to Jesus, taking our refuge. Flee. It says, we, we who have fled to take hold of the hope. We need to flee to Jesus, to the refuge, to our hope that is firm and secure. That's where we need to hide. I'll never forget, uh, I was in Zimbabwe a couple years ago, and, and, and I was in the church service there, and this person had drawn this, or uh, uh, painted this huge painting of a, of a lion. And one, one of the things the pastor said is, come and write in the mane of the lion, write your name there. Because we need to be hiding in the mane of the lion of Judah. We need to be hiding in him. That's where our hope is. But so many of us want to hide in different places, hide in this and that, and try to deal with the sin ourselves, try to shake ourselves free, and we cannot do it because you cannot pay the price for your own sin. You cannot pay the price for your own shame. You, it, it, it's impossible. You have to believe the gospel. In Jesus. So run to the right place, flee to the right place, hide in the right place, which is in Jesus. We look at the, at the prodigal son, the story Jesus shared, and the son is so full of shame, and he's just like, I, 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 just, I just want to get to the Father, and even if I'm a servant, I'll be, off, uh, I'll be better off than where I am now. So he comes to the Father, and he, and he, and he says to the Father, I'll, I'll just be your servant from now on. And the Father's like, no, you're my son. Some of us, we want to treat our relationship with God the same way. Jesus paid the price. You are a child of God, but you want to live as though, well, I'm just a child of God, but there's no inheritance or anything for me. I'm just glad I'm a child of God, and, you know, it, it, it's fine. And we live as if we are a slave. Whereas God's like, you're my son, my daughter. 
We look at different examples in the Bible of people that had shame. We look at David. He saw Bathsheba while he should have been out in a war fighting. And he calls her over and he sleeps with her. And what does he want to do? He wants to hide his sin. So he gets Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed. Murders him. But it's a shame trying to cover up. But it doesn't escape God. But we see him repenting, coming to God. We see that lady with a, with a bleeding problem for many years. And she comes and she's hiding in the crowd. And she's just like, if, if I can just touch the edge of Jesus' garment, I'll be made well. We see shame. She was unclean. She wasn't actually allowed to be there. But we see shame. She's hiding, and she just wants to do it in secret. What does Jesus do? Reaches out. Reaches out. We see in John 4, we see the story of that Samaritan woman that had been married five times, and the way I see it is there was just no more hope. She was just like, well, I've been married five times. I've messed it up five times, and, uh, and, and the man that she was now living with wasn't even her husband, but she meets Jesus at the well. Maybe she was trying to get away from all that because probably she was a woman that had a lot of shame, and people were like, oh, you've been married five times already, you know, and just that shame. And what does Jesus do? He comes and forgives her. He makes a way for her. You see, the way Jesus deals with shame is not the way we deal with shame. The way we deal with shame is we want to hide. The way Jesus deals with shame is bring it to me. And you can go free. And you can live free. And on a side note, us as believers should be doing the same, not holding the past of people against them, but forgiving and getting them back in so they can serve Jesus. There's no other place, Acts 4 verse 12, and there is no salvation in no one else. No, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no place else where your sins will be paid for where you can have eternal life. There's no other place but in Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross. And the price was paid in full. He didn't just pay three quarters and say, well, Darren, you need to work, now work for that last bit so that you can get into heaven. It was paid in full. Cleansed from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The last time I looked in the dictionary at the word all, it meant all. You know what I mean? It, it meant everything. We are cleansed from everything. There's that statement that says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And yes, we are sinners saved by grace. But let me tell you something. If you stay in that identity of a sinner... He will always live in that bondage. It's time for us to realize that I'm a child of God. I'm royalty. Yes, I'm saved. And I, I, I am free. And when Paul writes to the saints of Thessalonica and the saints of that, you are included in that because you are a saint, because you are cleansed of all unrighteousness. Your sin is not held against you anymore. Why? The price was paid in full. Jesus took all your sin on himself so that you can be righteous. Start to see yourself as righteous. Start to see yourself as a child of God whom Jesus have, has bought, paid with it with his life. But it was the full price. All promises are a yes. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. You see, all the promises of God are for you, and it's a yes. It's not just a, okay, maybe, if you're good enough, well, then you can have that or whatever. No, everything, all the promises are yes for you. The inheritance that you have in Jesus, it's for you. Take it, believe it. You're not just, you, 
But you didn't just slip into the door and maybe you were part of the family or whatever. No, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and yes, you, you repented of your sin and you turned to follow him with everything. You were was, you was set free. You were a child of God. The inheritance is there for you. When you read a promise in the word that is for believers, you can take that promise. You don't have to just be like, well, I deserve this. I deserve that. And yes, there are consequences. But let me tell you something, that God is greater than consequences. And we need to sometimes get past the thing of, well, this is just my life. I messed up, and well, this is it. You need to get past it and be like, I am free in Jesus. He paid the price. It's not a license to sin. I have to put that in there. It's the freedom that we have from sin. We don't need shame anymore. We don't have to live as though we don't deserve anything. Having all sufficiency. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As I said before, the word all means all. There's nothing that is out of that all. So we can have all sufficiency in all things at all times. We need to start believing the gospel. We need to start to believe what Jesus did for us on the cross. It was enough. It was sufficient. It paid the full price for us. So what I want to just challenge with you, you, you with at the end of this service, just Go to God and believe the gospel. Jesus paid the price in full. You no longer have to live like an orphan. You no longer have to live like a slave. You no longer have to live like someone who's just an outcast or someone who just slipped in at the last moment or whatever and maybe you're making it. No, you can live as a fully-fledged child of God, set free. The inheritance is for you. You are an heir of the kingdom. It's for you. The promises are for you. The forgiveness is for you. The, 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 the purity is there for you. And it's sufficient. God is able to make his grace, all grace abound to you. All the grace you need. You don't have to do it by yourself. You don't have to just work a bit harder. Just be a bit more devoted. Those things come, and those things are a sign of God working in your life. But that's not how you get there. You are free. You are a child of God. So that you, having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Let's believe the gospel. Let's believe what Jesus did for us on the cross. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning, and I just ask, Lord, that through simple words that you reveal this truth to us. I ask, Lord, if there's anyone here that is sitting and just has shame, I ask, Lord, that, that, that you would just take their shame away as they give it to you, that they'd realize that they don't have to be ashamed about the things that they've done. You've taken it. You've paid for it on the cross. There's no more shame. I want to ask for people that are struggling with sin and just not seeming to get over it, Lord. You paid for that on the cross, Lord. They can walk free. The chains are broken. I ask, Lord, for people here that just don't see themselves as, as fully-fledged children of God. I ask, Lord, that you'll reveal to them that they are your children, that the promises, that, you're, that, that the inheritance that you have for them is theirs. They can walk in it. And I ask, Lord, that, that each person, yeah, Father, even for myself, that we would realize that your grace is sufficient for us and that you, and that you give it to us, Lord, so that we can have all sufficiency, that we can have sufficient for everything, all things at all times, Lord. We're not beggars. We're not orphans. We are your children. We have everything we need in you. 
We thank you, Jesus, that the price was paid in full. I ask, Lord, that you reveal that to us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.